The Autism Research Institute relies on the generosity of donors like you to make this webcast possible. If you enjoy this presentation, please consider making a donation. Thank you. This webinar is made possible thanks to generous donor support. If you'd like to contribute, please visit our website at autism.org. Now, before we get started, I'll introduce our speaker. Dr. Matthew Brock is an Associate Professor of Special Education at The Ohio State University and a Faculty Associate at the Crane Center for Early Childhood Research and Policy. He has two major lines of research. First, he studies the effects of practitioner training on implementation of evidence-based practice and outcomes for students with significant disabilities. Second, he studies avenues for supporting the inclusion of students with significant disabilities in general education classrooms. And now I will turn this over to Dr. Brock. Thanks, Denise. I'm uh, really excited to talk to everybody today. I'm going to uh, share some practical strategies for promoting play and social skills for students with autism at recess. Uh, before I get too far in, I just want to be clear that even though I'm the one that's talking today, I have a, a larger team at Ohio State, so I want to recognize some of the graduate students that I work with, uh, Scott Duker, Mary Barzak, Chelsea Amati, and Eric Anderson. Um, without them, I wouldn't have been able to investigate and learn the kind of things that I'm going to share with you today. Next, because I am a teacher, <laughs> I'm going to share an advanced organizer with you so you kind of have an idea for where I'm going to go with today's uh, presentation. My goal is that I'm going to talk for uh, about uh, 35, 40 minutes, and then we'll have plenty of time to have Q&A towards the end. What I'm going to talk about first is just why uh, we might want to look at implementing uh, approaches like peer networks at recess. Next, I'll talk about what peer networks are and who they can benefit. Third, I'll talk about what evidence we have to know whether peer networks are actually a good idea. So the research base, that'll be just kind of a quick review. And then the meat of today's webinar really will be going through a uh, practical how-to for how you might do this with uh, students that you're in your own classroom at your own school. So you see kind of a one, two, three, four of the sequential steps that I'll talk through. And then I will wrap up by talking a little bit about how the strategies that I'll share today might work well when they're integrated in concert with other kinds of approaches at the same time. So first, um, I want to talk a little bit about what the benefits of recess are for all children, including typically developing uh, children. So researchers know that recess is a really awesome natural opportunity for kids to develop social competence and build social connection. It's an unstructured environment that children can learn how to negotiate conflict, cooperate, share, and solve problems. We even have research that shows that the degree to which kids get experiences engaging in social games actually predicts their future social competence and school adjustment when they get to middle school and high school. And uh, big organizations like the American Academy of Pediatrics and the Council for Physical Education of Children uh, have uh, mission statements out about the importance of recess and why uh, we need to, to keep it in all schools to support this kind of social and communication development. The problem is that some of our kids those on the spectrum may be physically at recess, but they might not be benefiting in these ways that they're actually engaging with their peers and getting opportunities to practice and learn these kind of social and communication skills. So um, my question uh, for, for you guys is just to think, have you ever worked with a student who's on the spectrum that if you went out and watched them at recess, you might see them just hanging out by a school staff member or maybe uh, uh, gazing at kids playing from a distance, walking around the playground by themselves, um, maybe some kind of stereotypic play like sifting through gravel or playing grass or engaging in pretend play by themselves, or maybe even just sitting on a, a bench for the duration of recess. These are all things that we have seen uh, either myself um, from my experience as a teacher or as a researcher when we've gone observed at schools. When kids are engaging in these kinds of activities for almost the entire recess, then they're really not experiencing any of those benefits that I shared on the last slide 
because you're not learning new social skills or uh, learning new ways to negotiate play if you're not playing with anybody else. So uh, that's a problem, especially for kiddos on the spectrum that are identified with social deficits, and we really need to improve those outcomes. Uh, recess can be kind of a missed opportunity uh, if we don't do something intentional to support them um, in a better way than just turning them loose on the playground. Before uh, I go any further, I want to be really clear that my work and this presentation is really focusing on kids who both have autism and um, would also be students with intellectual disability. So students that with more significant support needs on the spectrum. Um, if you are interested in uh, working with kiddos that uh, might that, that used to be that might have had a Asperger's label before that label went away, or you might characterize them as having high functioning autism or a student who um, is performing on grade level, uh, then really you might look at a, a different approach. Um, so what I'm plugging at the bottom is Connie Cassery's intervention called Remaking Recess, which you can see at re remakingrecess.org. I don't um, gain anything by recommending this. I, I just am recommending it because it's good and it's evidence-based just for a different population that I'm going to talk about. And um, the reason why uh, it's really quite different is it assumes that those kids are reading on grade level, so they are actually um, receiving a curriculum on social skills that's comic book based as well as their peers. Um, and it's just a, a kind of a more sophisticated, different approach. Whereas my um, my approach assumes that that uh, the kiddos are focusing on have more um, significant support needs. So uh, let's talk a little bit about what peer networks are. That's the approach that I'm going to recommend uh, today that you can put in place for kiddos at your school. So peer networks, in a nutshell, involve uh, having one or more peers volunteering to interact or play with a student with autism at recess. Uh, we recommend that folks uh, identify two to three peers uh, without disabilities. We do that for a couple of reasons. One is because it's more fun with peers if they're kind of part of a group instead of on their own. And the other is uh, kids are sick. So if we have about three, then if one person is out, we still have a core network of peers that we've provided some training and support to who are ready to support students with autism. Um, an adult, uh, usually uh, we've always had someone who's already out on the playground, so just whoever is supervising recess naturally. That might be a teacher, that might be a paraeducator. We've done this in schools where uh, it's just someone that's specifically hired to supervise recess. Also, all those people can be good facilitators. That person would uh, train peers in some really simple practical strategies on how to play and interact with a student on the spectrum. and on an ongoing basis, that person would provide some regular guidance and feedback, kind of a coaching model um, at recess to kind of support them as they learn to interact and play with their peer with autism. The goals of peer networks are to address those deficits that I talked about uh, initially. So we're trying to increase the number of peers that our kiddo on the spectrum knows and interacts with during recess. We're trying to promote positive interactions. We're trying to support appropriate play, ideally peer play. And uh, if we're lucky, we can even help the student with autism develop relationships and friendships that extend beyond the playground, maybe outside of school or back in the classroom, which is super cool. Our uh, focus today is going to be on uh, teaching elementary peers to use some strategies that are associated with pivotal response training. If you're not uh, familiar with pivotal response training, that's okay. Uh, is developed by Robert and Lynn Kegel. It's a really cool uh, model. That's a naturalistic interve uh, intervention based on uh, building initiations, motivation, responding to multiple cues, and self-regulation. That's really all you need to know as far as the background of PRT. It's just the basis for the kind of strategies that we've designed for peers. The next thing I want to talk about um, before I, I give you a practical how-to is just to convince you that we have good evidence that this is actually a good idea to, to use with students in your classroom. Because uh, as, a, uh, as a discerning person, you're not going to want to just uh, use whatever strategy someone recommends unless there's some evidence behind it. So I'm going to quickly share some of that support. So uh, there's a, a single case design study that looked at two individuals with autism. If you're not familiar with the kind of research design like single case design that I'm showing, that's okay. The important thing to know is just if you look in that baseline phase, you see that the data is really low. So we have kiddos that were not really interacting or initiating with their peers. When we put the peer network into place, you see that data jump up 
showing that we see the effect that we want, which is expanding uh, interactions and kiddos that those uh, students know. The next study I'm going to share um, is my own, and uh, this is a randomized control trial where I worked with 11 students. And the students that received the peer network intervention um, experienced a number of improved outcomes. They more than doubled the interactions they were having with peers. They more than doubled the time they were engaged in appropriate play with their peers. And we decreased the time that they spent in uh, solitary play, um, inappropriate play, or um, no play. Um, and when I say inappropriate play, I mean like they were doing something that wasn't following uh, recess rules. So maybe they were on the back court but they were drop kicking a basketball um, so that the other kids couldn't play instead of playing with him in a positive way which of course you want to decrease um, last uh, this was the the first day to really look at school staff implementing the intervention and they shared really positive feedback about yes this is something that i could feasibly do within um, my work day already it's not some big heavy lift that i'm having to do it's a simple straightforward practical intervention we've done a bench, uh, additional studies since this time but uh, we haven't uh, actually published our work so this to date are the two studies that are published but there's there's extra evidence too so that really is just to convince you that yes we have some some strong evidence that this indeed is a good idea. So next I'm gonna to transition to giving you some practical guidance for how um, exactly you would go about implementing a peer network at your school. And I'm gonna talk about what the role of the peer network facilitator would be. And as I mentioned a couple slides ago, um, a peer network facilitator can be anybody who's already the natural person to be out on the playground. Um, in some cases we've had uh, teachers who weren't naturally on the playground, but said, I really wanna be a part of this. So I'm gonna take you know, 15 minutes for my lunch and I'm gonna be on the playground and I'm gonna help facilitate too. That's cool, but that's not absolutely necessary. We've also had tremendous success with just working with the paraeducators or recess aides that are already out on the, the playground. So any of those models can be successful. The basic steps I'm gonna go through are first um, preparing and planning. So figuring out what is it exactly that you're gonna want peers to do. As you'll see, it's gonna be really kid specific. The autism spectrum is really wide. Uh, uh, Kids have, have lots of individual differences, so we're gonna to want to prepare for those. Um, second is kind of giving you guidance about how you might go about identifying peers who might be a good fit. Uh, third is how to give peers some initial training before you would ask them to start working with a kiddo with autism at recess. And fourth, um, the ongoing coaching that facilitator is gonna give at recess on a, on a daily basis. So first, um, preparing and planning. What I'm going to go through is really just kind of posing some questions that you're going to want to think about as you plan. So first, you're going to want to think about what is this student doing right now on the playground and how can we meet them where they are? So uh, in some cases, we work with uh, kiddos who might already be playing in an appropriate way. They're just playing by themselves and it might be uh, not, uh, not that complicated to figure out how we can bring other kids in. So for instance, if we have a kid who really likes to swing, that's great. Maybe part of what we're going to try to do is just swing beside them and engage with them in conversation. Or maybe we have a kid who loves to run around really fast all over the playground. Well, if we know that's the case, then we can think of what is uh, maybe a cooperative game or peer play that we can let them do that same thing in the context of playing with their peers, like tag or soccer or something that's a good fit. Um, next, uh, thinking about what kinds of appropriate play activities might the student enjoy during um, outside and inside uh, recess. So thinking about what are stuff that we know aligns with their interests. Uh, it was, we uh, have encouraged folks to actually reach out to parents too. If you're not sure, maybe parents can kind of fill in some gaps about things that you might know, not know that the kiddo likes to play. Uh, we actually had a real surprise with one student that we worked with that parents said, uh, you know, my, my son is a really good soccer player and no one had ever seen him play soccer on the playground. He had only stood by the paraeducator 100% of the time up to that point. And once we knew that, it was really, really easy just to have peers invite him to play soccer every day, which he was really good at and he loved. And it helped kind of shine one of his strengths that we didn't know he had until we communicated with families. Third, you want to think about how the student communicates. We've done this intervention with kids who um, are not communicating uh, using verbal speech. So they might be using uh, augmentative device. 
they might be using sign language, they might be using gestures. So we're really thinking about how can we meet that student where they are and fill in those gaps with peers so they understand what the student is communicating when they are communicating um, and thinking about um, how the peers should be talking to the student. Should they also be using sign or is it okay if they use verbal speech? How can they be clear um, and how should they be responding to the, the student's communication with autism? The last thing you want to think about is just other things that it might be important to tell peers. Uh, a lot of times, uh, a reason why peers might not have approached a student on the spectrum in the past is they might have some behaviors that are confusing or intimidating and peers aren't really sure what to do. So um, if we have some self-stimulatory behavior where a kid's spinning around in circles, um, peers might think, hmm, I don't know if that kid wants me to talk to them right now. I'm not sure what they're telling me. Maybe that spinning behavior is telling me to stay away. Or uh, if we have a kid who's loudly uh, vocalizing because something they enjoy doing, it, and peers might misinterpret that as uh, as a communication that they should be steering clear. Um, in some cases, maybe that, that might be communicating that, that that individual wants space, but really thinking about what behaviors like that mean for the specific student with autism and explaining that to peers in advance so they understand what some nonverbal behaviors might be communicating and they also aren't getting confused and uh, thinking that some self similar behavior is really something about what they did wrong when it might have nothing to do with that at all. Another thing that might be really important to talk about peers is uh, special interest or unusual conversation topics that the uh, kiddo on the spectrum might be um, wanting to talk about. And this is really individualized too because in some cases that conversation topic might be something age appropriate that other kids would want to talk about too. So we had uh, a kiddo that was really into NASCAR and we were able, I, I live in the Midwest so a lot of people are in NASCAR here, uh, we were able to find peers that shared uh, stock car racing as something they were really interested in. And in that case, it really was kind of a strength that we were able to leverage. In other situations, we might have uh, you know, a fourth grade student who is obsessed with a Sesame Street character like Elmo, uh, in which case we might be telling peers, like, it's okay to say something like, um, you know, I know that you think uh, Elmo is cool, but it's not really something that I want to talk about anymore and try to change the topic to something else that the student might also be interested in in a socially appropriate way like you would for other friends. So really a, a individualized response depending on um, what that special interest might be. Uh, if you were uh, making a plan, we kind of have a structured way on research studies that we record answers to all the questions that I just listed. There is nothing magical about the form that's on this slide. It's just to record the exact same things that I just uh, walked you through. But if you're interested in, in using a form like that, you, you would be free to do that, or you really could just record um, answers to those questions. So we've made an initial plan to kind of think about how we want peers to provide support and what we're going to need to share with them about the student. The next thing you're going to want to do is start thinking about how you're going to identify peers. Um, and there's several different ways that you can do this. The easiest um, way and that what I always recommend doing first is ask the kiddo with autism, is there somebody that you know that you would really like to play with at recess that you already know well that you played a little bit with in the past. That really is the best thing to do is really to go to that student and let them have a voice uh, in who they might want to already play with already. Sometimes um, that works better than others. So we've had an occasion where we've had older students, you know, fourth and fifth grade, and we have a, a male student with autism who just picks um, all girls for his peer network, in which case we might have to say, hmm, we'll take that into consideration, but we're going to, you know, pick boys also to be part of your network and, and kind of mix it up. Um, so that might be something that comes into play when you do this yourself too. Um, also, there's sometimes that we ask the student with autism, we kind of strike out there because they haven't really had a past uh, history of positive interactions with other kids. They don't really know their peers well enough to know who they prefer to play with, uh, which would kind of lead you on to the subsequent strategies. The next one is just to identify peers you observed in the past making positive attempts to interact in place. So maybe they've walked by your student, 
said something to them. Maybe it hasn't quite worked out well because they weren't sure how to interact, but they're already making an effort. So there's somebody who might be receptive to once I have support, yeah, I would love to get to know and um, play with the student with autism. Um, uh, third approach is just to work with um, colleagues to identify uh, students who have these characteristics. So they follow adult directions well, they model positive communication and social skills, and they're typically present at school. Um, really, that's that's all that uh, I would say are kind of requirements for good peers. I want to be really clear that um, I don't recommend just gravitating automatically to the kind of teacher's pets in the class who are the brightest or best uh, behaved students in the class. Um, I say that because those students might be great, but there's sometimes um, that if you pick the, you know, the smartest student in the class, maybe they're not going to be the best at relating and understanding uh, differences like uh, that someone might have is on the spectrum. And also, sometimes they're not the most uh, socially adept kiddos either, so maybe they're not going to be modeling the, the best communication and social skills. So um, really, um, instead of thinking about you know who's the best student in the, in the class, I would just recommend thinking about who follows directions, who's modeling good communication and social skills, and who typically shows up. And if uh, kids are doing those things, then often they make uh, a great peer. When you um, have identified peers and you're actually looking to invite them, um, we recommend having a conversation that kind of follows the outline that I'm going to share. So explain, hey, um, we're looking for students who might like to get to know and play with um, this particular student. Um, we think that you're going to have a lot of fun getting to know them, um, and we think that you're going to uh, have just a good time interacting and getting to know someone that you might not have gotten to know otherwise. And that if they're interested, well, we'd be happy to help them learn how to play and talk with this student. But if they don't want to, then they really don't have to um, because it's going to be fun and we'll, we'll find somebody else if they're not interested. Um, usually when we have a conversation like this, uh, we have um, plenty of takers. A question I often get folks ask is like, what if no one says that they want to do this? Usually we have the opposite problem that uh, we recruit some peers and then we have other peers ask if they can participate too. And we have more that we can actually train, um, in which case we're really in a situation where we go ahead and train, you know, three peers and then we welcome other students to informally join the network too. Um, they just might not be that kind of core group that we, we go through the initial training with. Another question that I get really often is, when do I loop parents into what's going on? We recommend talking to parents, both of the, the student on the spectrum and uh, peers um, prior to doing anything, prior to inviting the peers um, to ask for the permission to move forward. Different schools have done this in different ways. We've worked in places where schools have asked for formal permission by returning a permission form. Other places have just uh, sent a letter that says, hey, this is something that we're doing. Um, we're really excited to involve your kid because they are interested in playing with this kid at recess. You can use your own uh, judgment and school policy to do that. If your school doesn't have a policy in place, I might err on the side of getting formal permission just so you have kind of documentation that parents were in the loop and they know what's going on. Um, that said, when we do ask for formal permission, we have never had a peer parent turn us down. Um, I always tell teachers to, when they ask permission, to word it in a way that you're saying, we chose um, your son or daughter because we think they're going to be awesome at this. And usually the parents are you know, flattered that um, teachers saw something in their child that they thought would make them uh, a good peer buddy at recess. Um, third thing they're going to do now, you've already made a plan, you've already recruited your peers, is to have uh, a, a small group training with um, those peers that are going to support the student. And this usually only takes uh, about 25 minutes. We typically have done this during the student's lunch, so the facilitator might just invite those students to come back to a classroom and have lunch with him or her. And this is just an initial orientation to kind of fill in some information. Um, the real support is going to happen over time each day at recess with some kind of um, ongoing day-to-day -day coaching. What um, we recommend that folks do is first just share some background about the student. Um, I want to uh, emphasize that it is not necessary to share the child's autism label to run this intervention. 
So it's very possible just to talk about the student in practical terms, strengths, things they're really good at, and ways that need support without um, explicitly saying they have autism. That said, some children and their families might want to advocate and educate classmates about autism, so they might want to share that label. I would just encourage you to really leave that to the family and the child's uh, preference. Um, typically, uh, if we don't share a label, peers don't usually ask about it. They're really more interested in straightforward functional information um, that answer the, the bullet points that you see that we're going to share about what am I actually supposed to do and what do I need to know about this kiddo in order to be a good friend. So uh, things that we share are really coming straight from that planning sheet that I just shared. So you can pull straight from that during the meeting as far as sharing ways that this person likes to play, things that they're really good at already on the playground, special interests they might have, areas where they need support, things that might be confusing or intimidating and what peers can do about it, and filling in the gaps as far as how you can communicate most effectively and um, how you can understand what uh, the kiddo on the spectrum is communicating to you. Next, um, the really the most important part of the, the training is really teaching these strategies. And these strategies are aligned with pivotal response training. Um, as I read through these strategies, you may think, well, some of these are more applicable to a kiddo that I'm thinking about than others. For example, the first strategy that is uh, getting your buddy to actually look at, um, look towards you um, in order to be able to, to have a conversation with them. You might be thinking, oh, I already have uh, a student who's already awesome at um, orienting their body and making eye contact. That's not something I need peers to focus on. That's great. You might emphasize the other other strategies and said we have usually gone out on the play playground with this on a, a laminated sheet of paper like on the back of the clipboard so a coach can refer to this same sheet um, over time I'm going to go through each of these strategies um, individually and talk through them see so if a good feel of how you would share them with peers um, what the way that we share these in the training is the facilitator first would kind of talk through what the strategy is then he or she would model it to the peers and then we would have the peers practice it with each other so they feel kind of confident in doing it once they leave the training it's always a little bit awkward to do role play um the first time but once peers kind of get over that awkwardness while role playing the first strategy then it usually gets easier as they go but uh we know from research evidence that uh if we share peer strategies and have them actually practice it before they go out in the playground, they're gonna be more successful. So that's an important uh, component. So here's kind of a checklist for how we do it as far as we have on um, the facilitator check off. Yes, I showed the strategy and read it. I modeled it, I answered questions, I had them practice it. And then I gave them feedback by praising what they did well and helping them fix anything if there was something that wasn't quite right. Um, first strategy, uh, is just getting a buddy to look at you. Um, you guys probably already know this, but uh, you can make a judgment call about whether it is a reasonable goal for the student on the spectrum to actually make eye contact. Maybe it's not. Maybe a reasonable goal instead is just for them to look at the peer's face or to turn their body so they're looking at their body. Um, if eye contact is something that is super uncomfortable for the student on the spectrum, we can set a reasonable and attainable goal. We're really just trying to get that student on the spectrum to um, orient towards peers to the degree that the peer understands, yes, this person is listening to me and paying attention to me now. Um, I want to share a quick um, video of someone modeling how you might get peer attention. This is with uh, little guys. Um, I just want to apologize in advance, um, Denise shared that sometimes the videos kind of are um, spotty when we stream them over a uh, webinar like this. So if you are interested in going to this uh, video afterwards to look at it, this is just hosted on Ocali's um, Ohio Center for Autism and Low Incident Autism Internet Modules. And when you go to Autism Internet Modules, you're going to have to log in, but it's free. So this is something that you could find on your own, but it's in the peer mediated intervention module on Autism Internet Modules.
So I'm going to stop it right there, but hopefully that kind of gave you a taste of what um, you would need to do if you were um, modeling a strategy for peers. And you can see that those kiddos were not uh, comfortable at first actually touching uh, her to get her attention. And she's kind of coaching them to build uh, confidence in what they would actually need to do. Um, this would obviously look quite a bit different um, for older kids. Um, to get attention, you'd probably be, be doing something quite a bit different, like it's an idea of just that idea of uh, role play in order to build competence with those peers. Um, next strategy is um, to ask your buddy to play something with you. So we just kind of share that if your buddy isn't playing with anybody, you might ask them if they want to play something with you um, and try to think of something that your buddy would like. We ask peers to kind of think back to that initial training when we said, here's some things that, that we know this person already likes to do. Over time, those peers will learn new things that their buddy likes to do that they didn't know in the past. Um, we also encourage peers to offer choices, um, often, uh, if we give one choice that maybe our kid on the spectrum is not a fan of, they're just going to say no. But if we give them multiple choices, then usually we have a, a, a better, more positive response for the, the buddy that's on the spectrum. Next strategy is uh, showing and talking um, how to play. Um, the theory here uh, behind this strategy is that if we're engaging a student with a spectrum in a game and we're playing basketball or playing tag, that uh, many kiddos on the spectrum are not going to learn through observation like a typically developing kid. So um, most, most typically developing kids, if they play tag, they're going to naturally pick up, oh, I understand what the rules are, and I'm going to kind of fall in. Our kids um, struggle with that often. So the idea is having peers actually explain what they're doing as they're doing it and say, oh, that person is it now. That means we need to run away because if they touch us, then we're going to be it too. Oh, you just got touched. That means it's your turn to chase other people and tap them lightly so they can be it. So just really just talking through things in a way um, that our kid on the spectrum has a better chance of catching on to the rules of the game. Um, in other situations, uh, again, I'm from the Midwest, so a lot of kids are playing basketball and uh, uh, knockout. Uh, knockout's actually a pretty uh, complicated game to learn at first, so we would encourage uh, buddy to actually, uh, the peer to actually show their buddy, um, this time I want you to watch me do it, and I'm going to talk through the whole thing, and then you're going to play uh, the next time, and I'll kind of stand on the sidelines and encourage you and talk you through so that you're more confident with the rules. Um, next thing is uh, just to compliment your buddy. This is really about um, praise. So let your buddy know when they're doing a good job. We encourage peers to do this in the same way they would for a, a, another friend. Um, so if they feel comfortable doing high fives, fist bumps, pat on the back, whatever it is they feel comfortable doing that their buddy responds to well, make sure they do that um, when their buddy is like doing something for the first time, doing an awesome job interacting and playing with peers to let them know um, that they recognize what they're doing. And finally, I'm um, talking about the idea of uh, taking turns. Um, taking turns is something that a lot of kiddos have struggled with on the spectrum that we worked with. So we train those peers and just explicitly talking through that they're going to take turns and the order of turns and how that kid on the spectrum knows when it is and it's not their turn in an explicit way um, instead of thinking that uh, the buddy's just going to figure it out, actually being explicit about those things. So we model that for the peers and practice it also. So that's it for the, the general model and the strategies. The next piece is ongoing coaching. What we recommend facilitators do is at the beginning of recess, uh, just uh, reaching out to peers. This can be like in line as they're going out to recess and just having a conversation with them and saying, hey, what are one or two things that you really wanna do today with your buddy and kind of setting goals for themselves. The idea is they can check in at the end of the recess and say, hey, how did that go today? Is there anything that you want me to do to help support you to be able to, to meet your goals next time? Um, next, we encourage facilitators to praise peers when they're really doing awesome things. Sometimes this might be awkward to do in the course of them actually playing at recess, so don't interrupt play to praise them. Um, if 
if there's kind of a downtime where you're able to, you know, wink at a kid or give them a thumbs up, do that. Um, if you want to talk to them after recess, that works too. Uh, we also encourage facilitators to kind of jump in with prompts and encouragement when things aren't going so well, or maybe there's some kind of misunderstanding that needs to be worked out. Um, and we encourage facilitators to really check in at least a couple times during recess to think, see how things are going, even if they look like they're going well from the outside. Um, sometimes there's something that isn't obvious that that peers have a question about or want help, especially if it's really, you know, only the first or second day that they're trying this. And then finally, just checking in at the end um, of recess to see, uh, talk to peers, say, hey, you, your goal for today was to um, play soccer with your buddy. How did that go? Um, what could I help you with next time if, if you need help, if there's something that didn't go well? All right, we use for our research studies a fidelity checklist for coaching peers, and this just lines up with the exact same things that I just shared. So really just having the facilitator check off at the end, did I do all of these things? If not, I'm gonna make sure that I do them the next time. Um, something that I encourage folks in schools to do is uh, collect data sometimes at recess so you can share progress on social goals that are happening, um, and you can treat this as the same kind of data that you would take on academic goals to show progress on IEP outcomes. So there's two kinds of data that teachers have uh, have collected feasibly. One is frequency. So how often does something happen? So are our kiddos on the spectrum actually interacting more with their peers? You don't have to take data every day on the playground to do this. You could even have the facilitator say, hey, I need you to one day a week just take five minutes of recess and just make tally marks for that five minutes for how often that kiddo is playing with peers. And even from that small sample, you can kind of get a, a trend of whether uh, interactions are increasing over time. Another data that you uh, might consider collecting is duration data. Maybe you're not interested in making something happen a bunch of times, you're just interested in, can I enable this kiddo on the spectrum to play with peers for longer amounts of time during recess? You can use that same approach where you could tell the person already in the playground, maybe just one day a week, if you can take this five minutes and time, how long, um, with a stopwatch, how long is this person actually engaging in peer play? And um, how often are they either all on their own or doing something that's not appropriate. We're hoping that we can increase the, those peer play numbers. Um, and last thing I want to talk about is that when we put interventions um, like peer networks into place, we know that these do a really good job of increasing the interactions that are going on and creating this rich social context. At the same time, this doesn't automatically translate into learning uh, new social skills, like perhaps our kiddo on the spectrum still isn't going to be great at initiating the peers. Maybe the peers are always initiating to him or her. Or maybe our kiddo on the spectrum still isn't um, great at uh, taking turns without a lot of supports. Maybe that's an individual goal that we have. Um, if those are still things that they struggle with, then you can combine this with classroom-based social skills instruction and target those specific skills you're trying to generalize to on the playground. We've had a lot of success with that. Um, so don't think that this peer network is kind of a standalone thing you can combine with other things. Also, uh, often we'll see that we put this uh, peer network in effect at recess. Sometimes it'll naturally spill over to classrooms, um, or, uh, to general education classrooms where we see increased interaction. Sometimes it'll spill over to um, relationships outside of school. Sometimes it doesn't. Um, sometimes we have to intentionally intervene across different settings in order to kind of um, build up interactions across the school day. So uh, you might think about uh, interventions like peer support arrangements uh, in general education classrooms. That would be a whole separate talk that, to talk you through that. That's an example of something that you might use in combination with peer networks at recess to kind of, in a more comprehensive way, support social interaction across the school day. So I hope that uh, that was uh, practically a uh, useful uh, talk for you guys. Um, I, as promised, have talked for about 40 minutes, and now I would love to take your questions. Great. Well, thanks for all the information. And yes, we've got a lot of people still typing in questions. If you've got a question, just type it into the question section, and then we can read through them, and uh, we'll do as many as we can in the next 20 minutes. So I'm going to start, uh, if you could repeat the website, the Ocali website, where people can go watch the videos. A lot of people wanted to go watch it uh, after the webinar. So where is that exactly? 
Sure, I'll even back up that slide because I think the web address is at the top and then I'll make sure that I don't mess it up when I tell you what it is. I went past it, didn't I? Um, yeah, nope, yeah. I just had it there. Okay. Yep. So it's autisminternetmodules.org. Okay. So, and I will include that link in the playback that I send out later. So I'll make sure everybody gets it in the reminder email. So, and you said that people can sign up for that, but that it's completely free. Yeah, completely free. They just want you to make an account because Ocali wants to be able to track how many people are on their website and the kind of roles those people have. Okay, great. All right, so lots of questions. One of the first questions was the those great data sheets that you showed. We just looked at them really briefly. Did you just create those? Do you have a, a template for those that people could use? How can they develop those? Sure, are we talking about the planning sheets probably or the or the fidelity sheets? I think the fidelity sheet, that was when the question came through, but the, the person cool. may, may clarify that as well. Sure, I just made these myself. Um, you're welcome to just pull them off the, the slides and use them. There's nothing, they're, they're really just these exact same uh, bullet points just made into a checklist. Okay. So, yeah. so if people just want to go back and review the slides later, they could pull that information off of those. Absolutely. Okay, great. All right. That's not anything copyrighted from someone's book or. Nope, that's, that's all me. <laughs> okay. So I have a question here. This person says, I work for the Boys and Girls Club. And we have open play as well as structured playtime. We have around 180 kids per day at the main site and about 75 to 80 kids participate in open or structured playtime. Do you have any suggestions for a group that big when you're trying to integrate kids and it's not a school setting? Or do you use the exact same rules? Well, um, I think you could use the same principles. Um, the strategies I, I shared are pretty broad, so I think there'd be room to, to use them there. You might think about things a little a little bit differently if it's a really structured kind of play activity and everybody's doing the same thing. Um, then maybe what you're asking peers to do is really support a student within the context of something that's already structured. Often it's actually easier if there's really clear rules that it's something that might be easier for the, the student spectrum to engage in. Um, anyway, I would still um, start small with a, a few peers and train them um, first. Um, but just like on the playground, with, if, you had a, if you have a huge group like that, I would welcome other kids to, to help uh, informally and kind of build that network up over time. Okay. The next question is about what age you can expect to recruit peers. Like what age group are they ready to understand this? So we have done this with um, kindergartners, and we have been um, successful. So I think any age, if there's, if you're having recess, then I think uh, you can use uh, these principles. That said, when we've done younger kids, I when I talked about that initial training, I talked about doing it like in 25 minutes over lunch. When we worked with kindergartners, we did not uh, do everything at once. We did one strategy a week. Uh, and we spent about five minutes doing that strategy just before recess, and then we went out on the playground, and we did just one strategy at a time. Um, but they still did really, really well. Um, the kinds of ongoing coaching and support that you provide to kindergartners probably looks a little more uh, intensive than it would to fourth graders, who really, once you get them going, um, they're pretty independent. But uh, uh, I have been nothing but impressed with how peers have stepped up, even really young peers. Do you have any go-to activities? Like if you can't quite get things going <laughs> or that things aren't quite clicking, do you have any that pretty much, no matter what, you might be able to get things off the ground? I don't have go-to um, games that work for everybody. I mean, the, the go-to strategy that I would say if, if you can't get things going is if you can identify some kind of game that you know that your kiddo on the spectrum already likes before things started and just pull peers into what they're already doing. So I give you examples of that. Um, so one example of that is we had a kiddo who was engaged like in his own pretend play and that's really all he wanted to do at first. So we really talked to him enough that we understood what kind of pretend play he was engaging in and we pulled peers into that and after they build a relationship, then we kind of got him to engage in some other things. Um, so I'm not recommending everybody do uh, pretend play as a go-to. I'm more saying 
Uh, if you can think about something that the student is already doing, is there any way you could possibly uh, have peers kind of meet that student where they are? Uh, we've been really successful with that when they aren't uh, willing at first to engage in something new. So how about twice exceptional kids? So you've got a very bright child on the spectrum who maybe finds their peers maybe not up to their level. <laughs> so if they're trying to create these connections and you have a child like that, have you experienced any situations like that? Um, so we, so like I said at the beginning, we, I don't actually target kids, um, who, um, do not have intellectual disability. So I'm really targeting just kids who have autism and also would meet criteria for intellectual Got disability, it. some more okay. significant support needs. And if they, um, are twice exceptional, then I would say, go look at, at Connie Cassery's work. Um, it really, there is some unique things with kids who are twice exceptional where you're having, um, to kind of juggle some other issues that you don't always have to with somebody with a significant disability. The, the big thing is that that student themselves may not want you to go just recruit peers and, and have them um, interact with them at recess. Maybe that's not what they actually want. Um, so there's kind of a, a bigger conversation to have with the student on the spectrum about how we might um, design recess for them. And uh, Connie's work, that Remaking Recess website, does a really nice job of of highlighting that. Okay, so so other children with autism and who have negative behaviors such as self injury or or hitting and kicking. So how do if that's going on? If you've got a kid like that, how can you engage peer buddies with that, or is that just not the right strategy at that point? We have had some success with kids. Um, who have self-injurious behaviors or even aggressive behaviors. Um, we've always tried to make sure that we had some kind of strategy in place in advance where uh, whoever's supervising at recess has a way to promote positive behavior and respond um, to, to negative behaviors in advance. And then we're able to share those strategies with the peers. And say, And we're really honest with them where we say, this is what's going on right now with this kid <laughs> um, and we share things like, here's how you know that he might do something that's aggressive. Here's what you would do in that situation um, and be and be really straight with them. Um, there is a fine line there that if you have a kid who's aggressive to the point that he's hurting peers, and this probably isn't gonna work. Um, but if you have someone that it's really just self-injurious behavior or, um, or kind of verbal uh, aggression, or there's some kind of clear sign that they're gonna be aggressive before they, before they actually resort to aggression, then we've, we've still made that work. Okay, and what are some strategies surrounding bullying that might pop up around this? You know, sometimes relational bullying can come up if you've got kids who are, are willing to engage in this and maybe they'll get bullied, um, but also just bullying that happens to the, to the child on the spectrum. Um, we haven't, ever had any issues with bullying of peers. Um, we've only seen decreasing in bullying the kid on the spectrum after we have the peer okay. network in place. Got it. Um, Got it. I, I agree that I can see how maybe that would be a concern and that's something that we watched for, but in our experience, we, we haven't seen it. Okay, and so you talked about this a little bit already, talking about self-injury and, and some of those issues. What about just sort of generally stigmatizing behaviors like nose picking and these different things that might be off-putting for peers? Um, it, it sounds like you try to explain these things to them. Is there anything that you teach the peers to try to encourage stopping those behaviors? Or do you have the kids just ignore them? Yeah, so it, it depends. So. Uh, there's kind of a, a line that we draw between self-stimulatory behaviors that really aren't hurting anything and things that are really off-putting, like, uh, like having your fingers up your nose all the time. Um, so uh, we encourage peers to just respond in the same way they would to another friend. So if they want to say, hey, man, that's, that's gross. I wish you wouldn't do that. That's an okay, we say that's an okay thing to say because it's something you would say to a, uh, another friend and that's fine. Um, if it's something that's just a stereotypic behavior that is a little bit different and they haven't seen that before and it might serve a function for the student on the spectrum like hand flapping or spinning, 
in those cases, we try to just teach the peers, this is just something that they do that helps them feel good or helps them uh, calm down or express themselves when they're having a lot of fun and they get excited, whatever it is for that individual. And we really kind of teach them to be accepting of those behaviors as long as they're not interfering with playing a game. And we talk them through the idea that like they can hand flap and still play basketball and still participate with you. That's not a problem. Um, so really just depends on the, the nature of the behavior. So a parent on the spe- who has a child on the spectrum whose child ends up being invited to a play date with one of these peers might have some anxiety about what <laughs> how that might go. <laughs> so what could that parent do to help prepare the other parent? Or should the parent be present during that play date? Or would it be better if the first play date is at the child on the spectrum's house? Do you have any thoughts about that? I know that's outside of the playground realm. So. Sure, sure. I can give you some general thoughts, but I want to be clear, this is totally outside of, of anything that I would have, have I've studied. But as a parent myself, um, what I I might do is um, try to be present the, the first time to provide support if it's needed. Um, if they've already played together successfully at recess, it's probably going to go great. But if you think that the, the parent of the other child is kind of anxious or nervous um, and isn't sure what to do, then I would I would do whatever I could to make them comfortable that first time. And hopefully after they see things go well, they'll be more comfortable uh, in times in the future. Okay. And so if you're hosting the play date, would it be good to highly structure it or better to let the kids evolve on their own? Yeah, I I have a hard time giving a blanket answer to that. So if kids have been playing in an unstructured way really successfully on their own, I might let them do that. If uh, if things at school have been requiring a lot of structure and support from the from the parapro on the playground, then that's what I would do. But I'd really communicate with, uh, you know, what's happening at school and try to, to replicate whatever has been successful there, which is probably going to be different for different kids. So if you're a parent or a special, special education teacher trying to market this to your principal and your school to encourage these sorts of groups getting going, um, obviously can point to the to the evidence basis that's been developed through the studies that you've done and and other people. Have you seen anybody really successfully persuade or do you have tips on how people might bring this up? Um, Well, I try to sell this to uh, principals and school systems all the time when we run uh, research studies. And the good news I have is that I always have everybody respond um, positively, um, mostly because uh, we're involving peers in a way that's taking nothing away from their academic time. And I can sell this as kind of a win-win where we have this kiddo on the spectrum who isn't being able to gain these uh, possible benefits of recess. And we have peers who would really benefit from getting to know someone new, getting to learn about individual differences, and sometimes even learn some really cool new skills about how to communicate with somebody in a different way using sign language or AAC. Um, And I I also just try to emphasize that this is really um, closely supervised by somebody on the playground. So we rarely see any kind of uh, negative consequence of putting a peer network in place. But if someone were ever to see something negative happen, an adult would just jump in in the same way they would have if um, they were supervising someone else at recess. So it really is you know, super low risk and uh, possibility for high reward, both for the peers and for the student on the spectrum. Okay, this is a question about interest inventory. This person's asking, you know, with a with a student, this is a teacher, a student who may have limited communication and intellectual ability. And if you're having difficulty figuring out their interests that might work on the playground, have you had any strategies that you've used? We've just encouraged uh, parents to, um, uh, teachers to reach out to parents and have a conversation um, and uh, or if the student attends some kind of extracurricular where they go to the YMCA or something to reach out to those people and say, what have you seen this kiddo do that they're um, interested in? And usually after we talk to families or, or any kind of extracurricular folks that supervise that, we're able to come up with, with something. Okay. And so I think if we're all understanding correctly, what you would say, I had a question here about excessive scripting and how 
difficult that can be. You know, if a peer's trying to interact and someone's just scripting from Toy Story, it's, it's difficult to get a two-way conversation going. So how do you motivate in that situation the other peer to just kind of hang in there? Because that may be discouraging. And obviously you talked about preparing them and, and letting them know that that might happen. But after a week or two, you know, what's the next step? Yeah, so, uh, yeah, it's really individual specific, but uh, what we try to do if a kiddo is doing some kind of scripting or echolalia or something where you're not getting, a, you know, any kind of typical uh, re reciprocal response for them is just trying to communicate with the peer, like, what are the little things that you can see from your buddy with autism that shows that they enjoy what they're doing? Even if they're not going to say it, <laughs> even if they're not going to communicate to you in a typical way. Like, what are the signs that they are really enjoying the fact that you are reaching out to them and playing with them and getting to know them? And those are different for different kids. Uh, it might be like a little half smile that you see. It might be um, the way that they look at you. Uh, it might be their overall body language. Uh, but what is it that that peer can kind of realize, oh, yes, I can feel good about what I'm doing because I'm getting something back, even though it's not necessarily going to be what, what my buddy is saying to me. And I've gotten a few questions where, you know, obviously it's affecting the parents as well. It can be very hard to have a loved one who is struggling socially and doesn't have any connections with other kids. And I know that's outside of the work that you've done. I know we've had uh, Mark Durand as a person in Florida who does a lot of work with parents and talks about positive parenting. And that's another webinar that we've got on our website that people can go look at. He really talks about how that struggle for the family is trying to identify socially and fit in, especially when they're kids are struggling. So I'll send that link out as well when I send the, the follow-up email. But have you had, it, it sounds like occasionally you engage with parents. I mean, do you have any insights about how to encourage them that this, this is a step? that this might be something in the right direction for their student. Okay, I'm sorry, you cut out a little bit, but I think you asked just about general ways to kind of encourage um, parents, is that right? Yes, yes. Okay, um, so in the research that, that we do on this particular intervention, really our interaction with parents is limited to reaching out to them on the front end and kind of sharing um, data on the on the back end. So this is kind of an incomplete answer to that question, but uh, we've really encouraged teachers to, to collect data, to collect kind of anecdotal stories of what is happening that's positive at recess and share them back with families. Um, and especially when parents are you know, really kind of concerned about, like, I don't know how my kid is doing socially at all, it's really fun to be able to share with them, like, here's a really, a couple of really cool things that have been happening at recess since we've started um, Peer Networks, kind of gives them some hope and encouragement that um, positive things can happen both at recess and outside of recess. So setting up a feedback loop can be really helpful. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, to encourage parents. And uh, I'm sorry that you couldn't hear me there for a second. I apologize. We're having a windstorm where I'm located today. So <laughs> I think that may be the reason. But I was saying that uh, we've had a webinar previously by a presenter named Mark Durand. He's a, a person in Florida who works a lot. Yeah, on, he does great work. Yes, he does a lot on positive parenting. So I'll be sure to share that link in the follow up email after this talk. So Perfect. Dr. Brock, thank you so much for everything. Thank you for presenting today. Uh, for everybody who's still here, we will be posting the playback online. It should actually be there later today. So be sure to check out autism.org. We will send a link. And for all of you who are here, we'll be sure to send your certificates of participation about two hours after the talk. And Dr. Brock, I'm gonna hold you to it. You mentioned that there might be another talk that would be worth giving. So I'll reach out to you about that as well. All I right. appreciate that. Thank you for having me. Yep, everybody have a great day.